Hello and welcome to the Resilient Sessions. The Resilient Session podcast was born out of a conversation between myself and Sai Harmer, a military veteran who was injured in 2009. He said that when he was in hospital recovering, the days were really busy with people coming and going, but it was the nights that he found really hard as they were so quiet. He wanted to be able to pop in his headphones and just listen to something that would give him a slither of hope and be part of a positive conversation. So the podcasts were born. Their aim to create meaningful, inspiring conversations between two unlikely individuals who come together to talk about their experiences, careers, challenges and how they have handled resilience in their own lives to act as an inspiration to those listening. So I'm delighted to welcome Baroness Tanny Gray-Thompson and Neris Pierce. Hello, guys. Hello, Hi, Alice. Thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Pleasure. And Baroness, thank you so much for inviting us here to the House of Lords. Yeah, welcome. It's a rather strange and wonderful building in in the same way. It uh, is, with wonderful carpets, we've all noted. We, we have nice, a nice wallpaper as well. And there is some building work going on, so if you hear it in the background, please just ignore it. So to kick off the podcast, we like to start with each of you introducing each other. So Baroness, can I ask you to introduce Neris first of all, please? So Neris was in the British Army for four years. During this time, she travelled the world and took part in all the army had to offer. In 2008, whilst back in the UK, Neris was left paralysed from the chest down when a car reversed over her while she was riding a motorbike. Neris speaks honestly about the difficult, dark and long recovery journey she went through following her accident. She was on a wealth of strong medication, gained over five stone in weight and believed herself to be a burden to family and friends. Following an invitation to take part in a Blesma ski trip, her life started to change for the better, and she realised if she was to live her life again, she had to change her mindset. She threw herself back into sport and began by taking part in Blesma's shoulder ride. Since then, she's clocked up a list of athletic achievements to rival anyone, including medals in track and field, hand cycling, swimming, basketball, and weightlifting at the Warrior and Invictus Games. She's represented Wales in para powerlifting at the 2018 Commonwealth Games, has joined the Armed Forces para snow sports team and has set both British and world records in indoor rowing. She's also making a huge impression in events that are open to anyone and has recently won open water races against non-disabled swimmers. Neris continues to be an incredibly positive force and fully embraces her new life. She stretched herself recently through involvement in the making Generation R and the Grey Eye Theatre Company's production of This Is Not For You. She's an inspiration to a local community, coaching wheelchair basketball and spending much of her time working with adults and children who have communication and or behavioural difficulties. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And now Neris, over to you. It's amazing to be here with Baroness Tanny Gray Thompson. Tanny was born in 1969 in Cardiff, Wales, and christened Caris Davina. When her two-year-old sister Shan first saw on her, she nicknamed her Tiny, and shortly after it became Tanny. Tanny was always determined to find out for herself what she could and could not do, and her parents were always supportive and encouraged her independent streak. After a long battle with the local authority, they secured a place at Mainstream School where she discovered her interest in sports. Age 13, Tanny found wheelchair racing and at 17 she became part of the British Wheelchair Racing Squad. Just two years after this, she attended her first Paralympic Games in Seoul. Over her career, Tanny would also win medals at the Paralympic Games in Barcelona, Atlanta, Athens and Sydney securing a tally of 11 gold, four silver and one bronze. Beyond the Paralympics, she would go on to win five gold, four silver and three bronzes at the World Championships, to win the London Marathon six times and to break 30 world records over her career. Tanny married Dr Ian Thompson in 1999 and her daughter Caris was born in 2002. These days, Karis herself is involved in sports and Tani and Ian have become the taxi drivers and support team. Tani has continued to be involved in sports and physical activity. She is a board member of the London Marathon, Sports Aid Foundation and the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. In 2010, she became an independent crossbench peer in the House of Lords, taking the title Baroness Grey Thompson 
Tani uses her experience and knowledge during her debates in the House and has spoken on a range of issues, including disability rights, welfare reform and, of course, sport. Brilliant. Thank you very much. What a biography. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, quite a career. Yeah. It just makes me feel old, actually, but there we go. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Now, you have inspired millions of people with this amazing career of yours, both as a professional athlete and in your retirement as well. What are you most proud of? That's a really hard question because I think sometimes people expect you to pick, pick one medal and it's usually a gold medal. And, and there are races that I'm really proud of. Um, I think being part of the bid and the process for winning the 2012 Olympics and Paralympics and, you know, that was sort of 10, 11 years of my life culminating in the most amazing Paralympic Games. Um, I know, 10 or 11 years it took. Yeah, so wow. from right from the beginning, the bid, because people forget now that um, Birmingham are bid for the Games and Manchester are bid. Manchester are bid against Sydney. And, um, you know, actually all the Australian bid had to do was hold up a picture of Bondi Beach. <laughs> um, and the real frustration with that, at the time of year the Games are held, it's summer in Manchester, it's springtime in Sydney. There's more rain in Sydney at that time of year than there's in Manchester. But literally it was like, oh, we've got Bondi Beach. And so we learned a lot from that. So then, you know, when London came about, um, you know, lots of people thought it was stupid to, to even think about bidding. But, you know, as time went on, it got more real and then we won and then we had to build it. So for me, actually, I think being part of that, that was the culmination of my, my sport. You know, I knew I wasn't going to be able to compete there because I was, I was well retired by then. But um, I wanted to make it a really good Games. What was that like on the opening at the opening ceremony, being there, knowing, you know, what part you'd played and making that happen? And the Olympic opening ceremony was amazing. And actually, it was the first time the Paralympic opening ceremony was different and had a lot of disability rights in there and, you know, had this huge sort of um, model of Alison Lapper who's had thalidomide. So we'd, we'd never had our own ceremony. Um, and that was just just amazing. And also possibly the most terrifying thing in my life. Um, I, I was asked about a week before, did I want to be floated a bit above the track on a wire? So I went, yeah, OK, I'll do anything. You know, yes, absolutely. Didn't actually ask how high it was, and it was 65 metres in the air. Wow. And it was horrific, <laughs> honestly. I can't repeat most of the words I said in the night. It was absolutely just terrifying. But I'm so glad. You didn't glad look it. terrified. You didn't, no. And I think that was fear. I, I literally didn't eat all day. And then, you know, I'm, so um, Joe Townsend, who's ex-Marine, you know, he was coming down from the orbit into the stadium, you know, with the torch. And I'm sort of, I'm, I know Joe quite well, and he was just like, yeah, just get over yourself, Tanny. You know, <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, you know, this is awful. And he's like, no, it's just, just get over. So, you know, he, he's had the responsibility. So at least I didn't have any responsibility in the torch, which was good. So what has driven you? What, what do you think has motivated you to achieve all these amazing things? Uh, I, I wanted to be a good athlete and you know I grew up in Wales and it was a very sporty family and I was encouraged to be active you know back when I started no one had even heard of the Paralympic Games so a lot of the coverage when I was a young athlete was all very aren't you all brave and marvellous and it was isn't it marvellous you do a marathon oh because you're disabled. yes because it's and, and you know and it's like do you train yeah quite a lot yeah 15 times a week 50 weeks a year and you know how did you actually respond to when someone says something like that to you I'd find that very hard to not be rude. It, it, it's that balance, though, because mm. um, it doesn't actually help being rude. It might make you feel better for 30 seconds, but it yeah. doesn't help change attitudes. And for me, a lot of it was about changing attitudes. And, you know, I still get people who come up to me and, and sort of say, oh, I'm so sorry you're in a wheelchair. Well, for me, it's not the worst 10 things in my life. No. But I think that's <laughs> because of, you know, I, I was um, born with spina bifida, could walk for a little bit, um, and then actually the chair was freedom. So I never felt I'd lost anything because having a chair for me was, you know, I could actually do stuff. When I was walking, I could walk about 10 feet and I'd fall over. So, you know, and lots of people's experience of being in the chair are really different. Yeah. That, I, mean, like it's, I mean, walking isn't one of the 10 words, you know, it's not something that I miss about being stuck in a chair. Um, I miss the freedom um, of being able to hop over a fence or climb up a mountain or whatever, but I don't miss being able to walk per se. So. I, th I think that's really interesting because I think people's it's people's perception of what the worst thing in yes. our lives are, yeah. and it's actually not always <laughs> what not. ours are. Yeah, you know, being being kind of well, the thing is, I'm 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 only five foot one, so if I even <laughs> stood up, I would be much bigger than I am now. But you know, I kind of what I really want to be is six foot six. You know, so um, you know, it's just interesting perception. It is. I think we have quite similar, um, you know, kind of your top ten worst things that could happen in your life or have happened happen to everybody. 
and it's actually really normal things in in the able-bodied world and they expect them to be something special because you're in a wheelchair and actually it's not you know yeah I mean and for me I mean oh it's halfway through last year I ended up um here you go. My, my daughter, for some reason, took my wheels out of the car, my chair wheels, and, and put them under the wheels of my car without telling me, and I ran them over. Um, and then she was like, well, why'd you do that? Well, like, I didn't know you'd put them under yeah. the wheels of my car, otherwise I wouldn't have run them over. Um, and, um, you know, things like that, we go, that's really stupid. You know, I've now just completely broken a set of wheels, mm-hmm. and I need... So it's things like that that, you know, is inconvenient, but it's yes. not... You yeah. Sometimes just need to laugh at stuff like that. So, Neris, can you tell us about your injury, please? Yes, um, 2008, um, I was back here in the UK. A uh, car reversed off a curb, uh, took me in the motorbike over. Uh, my legs got crushed, uh, my left one really badly, injured my right shoulder and my head. And the bones in my left leg fixed, and I, th- I thought that I was going to be okay. But I ended up with this neuropathic pain, which was where my nerves had ended up crushed. Um, Basically, it was like this 24-7 burning hot oil was being poured on my legs all of the time. Um, So I tried to put loads and loads of drugs, loads of treatments later. Um, They tried a nerve block um, and that didn't go um, to plan. Um, And I ended up paralyzed from the chest down from a bleed. Um, so, um, it stopped the pain. <laughs> uh, so one win. Um, so yeah, it was, um, it, my life then changed completely. And what um, was, what period it wasn't of time was fix. that over? Um, so, um, over the year. Okay. Um, so I kind of had this hope for a year that it was going to be fine. Then it definitely wasn't. Um, and then over the next three years from that point, um, you know, it, it was, you know, really evident that um, I was going to be paralysed from the chest down. I was going to have to use catheters, bowel management routines. I wasn't going to be able to sit up independently by myself. Um, so it all kind of dawned, I suppose. Um, I put on eight stone because of the drugs um, and, yeah, felt like I'd lost everything. And how how do you move forward from that? I am just forever grateful and, um, you know... I, I, I can't explain how much support my family, my friends, turning up when I was in hospital for months and months, when I was bed bound at home, when I had carers in all the time, that they'd turn up and I'd ignore them because I thought that I I literally would have been better off to, or they would have been better off if I was dead because they weren't wasting their time on this useless thing that I'd become you know this you know just not even identifying as a a person anymore just this blob that was just taking up family and friends time effort and I'd ignore them you know I wouldn't answer the phone I'd if they came round, I'd turn my head and just not speak to them I just wanted them to go on with their lives but they kept turning up and they kept coming round. And then they brought into my life Blesma, the British Limbless Ex-Servicemen's Association, and this Blesma support officer who turned around and said, um, you can't sit up for more than two minutes. You're bed bound. We realise this. You have blood pressure. Says, We're taking you skiing. And I looked at this guy as if he was crazy. And the, con- you know, the conversation ended with my sister turning around and saying to me, get on the plane or I'm leaving you at Heathrow Airport. And I couldn't even comprehend... I mean, I couldn't function at home, let alone in Heathrow Airport for two weeks. Um, So I got on this plane and they changed my life forever when I got back on that ski. And, you know, they got me off the drugs and into elite sport and back me pushing me to be better to do something with my life. And then to watch my family and friends that stood by me come with me on that journey just yeah the turnaround was and you know my parents my parents are still really harsh you know I won an open open water swim event for able-bodied people and my dad was like oh well weren't you weren't you faster than that you know and I was like you know there's Cheers, there's dad. always that expectation yeah. that's just above but always in kind of a supportive jokey way you know they wouldn't care if I came last they'd still be there. You've achieved so much in your in your career and within sport as well. Um, what are you most proud of? 
so I went obviously during the accident and it took away, not just for me, but for my family, what they expected of my life. And my parents had put in all this time and effort making me well-rounded and independent. And suddenly I'd lost that. And so for me, it's about getting back that feeling and my parents saying that I am independent now, I am well-rounded, I can still achieve things. Um, and other people seeing that and being kind of pushed to improve their life. So whether that's taking that 10 minutes to um, take their children out to play football um, or walking that extra bus stop to lose the few pounds, whatever it is, but it's being able to and it's always that word, isn't it, inspire, but being able to show people that they can make little changes. And my accident left me in a position where I could help people affect change in their own lives. And I've really loved that. Okay, wow, that's great. And you both, you've mentioned there about your family. How much has your upbringing impacted sort of the person you are today? Oh, my my family's crazy, um, and uh, my my mum's Welsh as Welsh can be. Um, yeah, <laughs> brought, a bit left brought up, up in brought up in Llanelli. Um, but um, I had a bit of an interesting childhood because um, uh, my mum's completely blind, um, and my dad is um, what people term as able-bodied, um, and they met in an unlikely situation. My dad was a taxi driver on the side, and. And my mum's had this amazing career in the prison service. My dad's this engineer and they always pushed us to be outside and be better every day. And so I was really well supported, pushed all of the time to be the best version of me, but with no pressure on things that I wasn't great at. You know, they always wanted me to try, um, but I've had always had dyslexia. English has never been my thing. Um, but, you know, they, they accepted that and I'm great at math, so let's move on, you know. So they kind of showed me that different is OK and different can be brilliant. OK. So I'm just really fascinating because, you know, I've got a daughter who's just about to turn 17 and suddenly people now talk to her, not me, uh -huh. which I think is very interesting. Um, and, and so what was your experience of, of having a mum who's disabled and, and how did people treat you differently as you were growing up because of your mum? Oh, people treated me completely differently and people started um, forwarding questions to me when I was about four. And at that kind of age, people already directing a question, handing my mum's bank cards back to me. And so I turn around and go, no, mummy's here. You know, it's mummies. And so it was, yeah, as I got older, obviously my ability to talk to people about why that wasn't how... Mm -hmm to treat somebody just because they had a disability uh, was better. But from the age of four, I started fiercely depend uh, like uh, defending my mum's independence. And it did lead to a, a peer gap. So, you know, I can't claim that my, my childhood was uh, normal in inverted commas, whatever that means. I mean, you know, it's, it's always a weird thing that my mum's disability actually, I think, made me better as a person and better able to deal with situations but you know it just shouldn't be that you know I'm having to tell people off for handing stuff back to me at age four you know they should treat my mum and I never saw the disability I just saw this amazing independent woman who worked full time um, you know for the prison service so I had a completely different view Kara stands there and just says, Mummy, I hear voices. Do you hear voices? <laughs> <laughs> are, they, are they talking to you, Mummy? I love Mum, that. Or her best one, I was, um, you have your invisibility cloak on yes. again, Mummy. <laughs> yeah. um, even, yeah, you've, you have it all of the time. And now I've experienced it firsthand. You know, I was out um, uh, yesterday and somebody started talking to the person with me and they were just like, she, she is there even though she is in a wheelchair, yes. you know. It's not a voodoo science talking to a disabled person. Yeah, you can do you it. Know, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's funny watching people, you know, struggle with how to treat a disabled people and speak properly to them. Mm. Or, Instead know. of just getting on with it. Yeah, well, or just speak to someone... them like a normal person. How do you speak to a disabled person? Like you would anybody, anybody else. else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So Baroness, how about you? Because I know obviously um, your family has played a big part in, in who you are, but also in your upbringing as well. Uh, I think your parents, from what I've read, have, have, have sort of really motivated you into being the, the person you are today. My parents were amazing because, you know, I, I, I very gradually got paralysed. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm missing about, I don't know, nine or ten vertebrae at the back of my spinal cord. So okay. so there's this sort of big mush of a spinal cord that sort of oozes out and it's all, you know, just a bit of a blob, really. Um, and then as I grew, my spine collapsed. So I've got scoliosis as well. And that severed my spinal cord. But it happened really slowly and, and there wasn't any pain. I didn't miss a day of school. I just very gradually stopped walking. And then... Dad was an architect, and I think he he realised how inaccessible the world was if I was either wearing calipers and crutches or in a chair, and he kind of figured out I was better off in a chair because at least I could move myself around. And like with calipers and crutches, I couldn't, I could walk less than I could, you know, w- without them. I mean, it was just it was awful. So, um, and there were lots of people who told my parents about all the things I would never do. So, I only, I only found this out much later, you know, when I was seven. You know, people telling my parents I'd never get a job and never get married and never do that. And it's like, oh, seven. So um, mum and dad protected me from a lot of that. And because I'd started off in mainstream junior school because I could walk at, at the entry point, I, I was able to stay. But the big change came when I was due to go to main, or high school. And, you know, back then, education for disabled children was completely segregated. And there was no, you know, generally it was a very poor level of education because there was no expectation. And, um, you know, the long story short is my dad threatened to sue sexual assault for Wales over my right to go to a mainstream school and was complete pain in the neck. And, you know, um, and, and really bizarrely, there's a amazing woman, Mary Warnock, Baroness Warnock, and, and she wrote in 78 a green paper on education for disabled children. My dad used that. And then 30 years later, I'm in the House of Lords with her having a debate <laughs> of since 30 years of the Warnock report saying, you know, because of you, I'm here. And, to be fair, she just looked at me and went, huh, marvellous. Um, which is actually what my dad would have done. But, um, you know, it's, it's, wow. it, but, but it's having people around fighting, you know, that my dad knew how the system worked, knew who to write to, you know, just, and, and I guess what I saw growing up was lots of disabled children who didn't have that. And so that influenced my life as an athlete and the stuff I do now is because, you know, it, it's to have that resilience and, and that determination to fight through some of those things when they just seem, a bit daft. I mean, stupid that I couldn't, you know, go go to a school with everyone else. Um, you know, I needed an accessible school. That's all I needed. Um, so, you know, I think that just taught me a, a lot of stuff. No, I didn't realise that 30 years later I'd be reading white and green papers for my life, but hey, there you go. You know, my mum had the experience of that as well, and she talks about it, that um, my mum ended up being forced into a school uh, for the blind. Um, so it was all just... And, you know, they didn't mix with um, able-bodied students and everything else. It was just a completely separate school. And the hangover of that is this kind of uh, institutionalised feeling of the word club and the word, you know, because it was all blind clubs, blind this, blind that. And, you know, so my mum's still kind of... Uh, dragged by that so I'm you know it's amazing to see what you guys are doing here really fighting for the rights and I've now been into schools with making generation R and you see wheelchairs cutting around and walkers and they're just completely integrated uh, it's brilliant to see there's an amazing hashtag at the moment called ask don't grab and it's around it starts off around visually impaired people but it's widened out into wheelchair users and you know saying it's not okay just to start pushing somebody you know around and um person who started Dr Amy Kavanagh um people have just come up and grabbed her and what you're saying about what happened to your mum yes and she just happens to work relatively close to the RNIB and she said the number of people who come up to her say do you want to go to the RNIB and you know <laughs> and, and she said you know recently it was like Hopper's date at night yeah. and she's like no because we don't all live there yeah. Yeah. you know just and, going for a drink actually. yeah <laughs> and so it's things like that you know it's but actually some of it I think is useful that we can within sort of you know, that there is a disability humour and that we can find sort of something amusing in that in terms of trying to, to educate people to, to just think differently about how we behave. Mm. Yeah. And I think even just what you were saying there about, you know, when I said, oh, how, why aren't you just being rude? But rudeness doesn't make change happen. Right. And even just in the smallest conversations, it's about making that change. Um, so. so even now, I definitely find that humour and good nature get me much further than having a go at somebody, you know, not being able to get off a train, oh. um, you mm. know, um, <laughs> to- accessible toilets being filled yeah. with got the right stores, here, yeah. you know, so 
gone into schools and there's been an accessible toilet, but you can't get into it because they're using it as their paper store, you know, and it's worked much better for me. And I've had better influence over making change by saying, oh, well, you know, I know it's inconvenient. Any chance we can move the paper so that I can go to the toilet? You know, and, you know, it's kind of the same thing, sitting there looking out the train going, hi, help, you know, rather than getting angry about it has meant that they've really kind of, you know, my local train station, Ascot, has really, they've given me a, per, a number to phone them. Um, so when the train that I've, station I've got on forgets, I can ring them and go, I'm stuck on the train on platform two. And they wouldn't have given that out if I'd have been, you know, argumentative and in their face and aggressive. And I just don't think it helps. Because Baroness, you're on the board of the Transport, <laughs> Transport for London, aren't you? Oh, well, right? I was. Oh, yes, you were. Um, okay, yeah. fine. <laughs> Jump ship. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, it's interesting because you look at, sort of, well, I think it's interesting, transport in London. And, you know, it is different from the rest of the country because of the connectivity. And, and big cities are different from rural areas. And, you know, about a third of the tube, London tube is step free. But, you know, it was built 150 years ago when women weren't allowed out on their own, let alone, <laughs> you know, us. And so... Um, you know, there's there's a huge amount of work trying to get it to be more accessible, um, but it's also you know there's the the, the physical infrastructure. You know, I, I agree. You know, I, I tweet a lot about trains um, because that's so important for so many disabled people. And um, I did have an experience that um, you know you talked about using humour. Um, I was at a train station and my ticket wasn't working, and a member of staff refused to allow me through the barrier that I could fit through and was trying to send me to the wide barrier and then said you know people like you can't make that decision about which barrier you go through so my defense mechanism what do you mean Welsh people <laughs> stop I went oh sorry oh did you mean the wheelchair <laughs> oh got a bit confused there and and so for me that's the only way I can do it but um and to be fair he sort of stopped um but but you know that there's also the bit we shouldn't have to you know always just try and find humor or just suck it up because that that's not always easy to do because that's I think you know maybe if you've got you know, lots of skills that you can draw on, that that can be okay. But for a lot of people, the, the daily low-level discrimination they face is just really wearing, really tiring, and, you know, it's just not appropriate. And it's about that kind of constant, you've struggled to get off the train, you've struggled to get on the train, then you get to a hotel miles away, and then you can't even get into the room that you need to sleep, and you've got to function the next day. And occasionally it does just tip over the edge, and, you know, you have to wheel away into a corner... And people say to me, well, why didn't you complain? I was like, because I would spend my entire life yeah. on a complaint. And that only makes me feel negative and bad. And so you have to pick your fights. What social media allows is a community of disabled people. And it's true, you know, we, we, we don't have disabled people protesting in the same ways they did in the 70s and 80s because, you know, we, we don't get disabled people chaining themselves to... Actually, one of my colleagues here, she chained herself, chained herself to carriage gates, I think, in the 80s for, for disability wow. rights, which is so cool. Um, but, but social media allows that connectivity, which I think is really important in terms of highlighting some of those issues. Do you know, it's amazing support as well to feel that you're not the only one and that because sometimes those things like the train, you know, whatever it is, you kind of end up feeling victimised, like you victimised. Then you see the wider problem and it's actually not just me. It's And so you have that kind of support network in like a weird way that's not me and you have talked, but you've had a problem getting off and on or whatever, or curbs not being dropped or whatever, and I've got the same problem, so now I feel less, like, taken, you know, yeah. It's less personal, personal isn't it? Personal, yeah. yeah. So I was going to ask you both, and we've we've asked all our guests this, but what are your challenges that you face and how do you overcome those? Do you know, I, I suppose for me, it's the same. I think I had the same things when I was, before I ended up in a wheelchair. And that is that you have ebbs and falls of, you know, um, things building up on you and then you hitting a major low point and then you're working them out. Um, just now, obviously, I'm more I'm more isolated because I live by myself. I train by myself, so and I put a lot of pressure on myself. So it's things like putting socks on. Some days my legs spasm and it takes me twenty minutes to get one sock on. And you know, it's <laughs> it sounds like a really simple thing putting your socks on, but you know, it kind of is a build up. And then more serious things happen. You know, your ramp breaks, your wheelchair breaks, whatever that really impact your life. And 
I, you know, I've had problems over this this last summer where um, I hit a mental health low, and it was about talking to people for me, making sure that I got out the house um, and I put something in place to meet a friend, to go hand cycling, to uh, meet up for drinks with people. Um, those are kind of my my go to coping mechanisms, and also to sit back on occasion and. I'm quite a high speed, on to the next thing. And then I look at last year and I was like, hang on, actually last year, I managed to go to the Commonwealth Games. I managed to complete um, you know, all of this, these challenges. I managed to go and do Making Generation R and face my speech and kind of dyslexia demons. And sometimes I just have to write down in a notebook those things that are positive that I've achieved so that on my dark days, I can force myself to open that book and just take a look and take a breath because, yeah, you can feel like you're sinking and actually you forget how far you've come and losing eight stone, getting off all the drugs, whatever it is. Um, yeah, it's just for me writing those down because otherwise I kind of cuff them off as things I should have done. Um, so, yeah. Amazing. I think for me coming from elite sport where... You know, everything is quite regimented and I used to do a lot of my, my own sort of personal planning for my training and, you know, it's, you have two weeks off a year. And I mean, the only year that in the whole of my career that was different was the year I had Karis where I had an extra week and a half off. So, um, <laughs> that is you know, unbelievable. Well, wow. that's, that's, How did you do that? I mean, it's off from having a bit of, wow. Um, I well, know I just um I, I I kind of well actually every female athlete does it you plan you have a cut off time for being pregnant which actually was 6 months before Commonwealth Games so she was born 6 and a half months before and um yeah. you just have to have to get on with it and babies don't do much really did she um, sleep though no not at all yeah, no but anyway oh, that's a whole other thing no not at all she was too did you um, take her out to the Commonwealth Games oh well so those ones were Manchester but no I, I oh. took her to a training camp at 3 weeks old in Spain wow and they just kind of sit in the pram. And then when she was bigger, we used to just stick her in the long jump pit with a bucket and spade. But anyway, <laughs> I'm never writing a parenting manual. But um, anyway, um, so... so you she know, had a nice time. <laughs> yes, all good. Um, you know, sport's regimented. And, and one of the things you have to do is be really self-critical because you're looking for these tiniest margins. You know, you're looking to improve your personal best by 0.01 of a second to make the team. So I, I think for me that has been really useful in terms of, you know, you keep your training diaries, what's going well, what's not. And, and, you know, what you're saying about finding those moments where, you know, things are going better than you remember and, and, and just trying to find that that balance in, in what you do. But I think for me, the, the the pressure I feel as I live in the northeast of England, I work in London, you know, I'm guilty when I'm away from my daughter, when I'm home, when I'm whatever I'm doing. And, and I think I've learned to to just not feel some of the guilt that some people would like me to feel. I think it, it's the sheer weight of things I want to do sometimes, you know, because it's, yeah, I want to fix or try and or make sure that train travel is fixed and buses and taxis. And, and it's this never, there's this really long list of things that we don't actually yet have equality on. And it's being able to just sensibly pick and choose. And then some of it is people's expectations of me in terms of what they think I can do, you know, which is um, I can't wave a magic wand and, and suddenly change legislation. Um and although, though I do have one person who writes to me on and off asking me to introduce a private member's bill to ban one particular person from the TV. And you have to say, <laughs> I can't do that. Yeah. But anyway, but you know, it's, it's some of the, but, but sometimes it's the expectation that people think that just because I used to be an athlete and I do this, I can just click my fingers and stuff will happen. I can influence and I can nag and I can be a pain in the neck, but, um, and I can change things, but, but it's not always in the way some people imagine. It is that self pressure, isn't it? That's I think it's a personality trait because I had it before I. So obviously I've ended up in a wheelchair, uh, but I had that same personality trait before I ended up disabled. So um, and that was that self pressure, never being good enough, never being quite at the level that I wanted to be in anything I was doing. Um, and so I put a lot of that pressure, and then I assumed that everybody else was putting that pressure on me as well. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting game when you have that mindset of kind of trying to level yourself occasionally and go, hang on, do you know what? You've won 16 Paralympic medals, <laughs> you know, 30 world record. I, I just, you know, for me, that's like, how can you ever want more from life? But, of course, for yourself. Yeah, there's a few more races I'd like to yeah. have won. But, 
But it's that balance. It, it, it's just, it's hard. I mean, you know, people say to me, well, what would you have done if you weren't a wheelchair user? Well, I don't know. Um, and if you I know, was 10 foot tall. Yeah, and, <laughs> and if, 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 you know. And, you know, I, I don't know what I would have done. But, but the personal, you know, I look at m- my mum, my sister, that personality trait's there. It's not different because I'm a wheelchair user. It's it, it it's kind of in our family. Mm. It's so like discipline as well. It sounds like, you've, well, I suppose being an elite athlete, you have to be disciplined and you've taken that attitude to how you handle your mental health. Would you say that's, you know, keeping that balance and that pressure of... I mean, in sport, there's only so many hours a day you can train mm. and, and, you know, you can overtrain very easily. So you have to be quite disciplined in that. And if you're having a, a tough time training and competing, doing another 15 or 20 hours training a week is not going to help you. Um, the challenge with stuff I do now is you can sit at your desk for 15 hours, 16, 17 hours a day. Or if you're on doing legislation, you might be in the chamber for 10 hours. And, and that kind of balance about sleeping, eating, all the other stuff that goes with that, it's, it's not the same, you know. And did you ever imagine, um, because you studied politics at university, hmm. that you'd <laughs> ever be sitting here as a, as a life peer? No, um, well... Um, I, I very grandly said to my head of department I was never going into politics because that was for losers. <laughs> when um, we were having a discussion about whether I wanted to stay on and do a PhD and it was like, um, it's not for me. And um, no, it was interesting. So I think most of my year went into politics. And then it was it was probably in my mid-twenties that I was thinking about disability rights and sports politics as opposed to the type of politics I do now. Um, and probably from my very early 30s I was thinking about... Uh, this type of politics. Um, but no, I mean, the, the way it works is, you know, I was nominated to come here and there's an interview process as a crossbencher, which is quite surreal. And and it, it's, you know, it goes over a period of months. And when I, I knew I was in, I got an email and I rang my dad and he was like, well, expected nothing less of you. Great, thanks, Dad. Someone had told him when I was 21 that I was going to end up in the House of Lords, and he went, see, Norman was right. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? That's okay. Normal, like, well done, Norman. Yeah. So it's things like that that, I mean, I just, I never felt pressure from my parents, but but it was, you know, you, you have a, a privilege in your life that, you know, don't just sit around and waste your life. Don't waste the time you've got. So it never felt too much, but it felt, you know, actually quite quite supportive, so... So now that you're here in the House of Lords, what do you want to achieve? What would you, you know, like your legacy to be? Um, I mean, there's a list of sort of legislation that I would like to change in terms of things like abuse of blue badge spaces, which just really annoys me. Um, but but there's also, you know, we, we deal with the legislation that's in front of us. Um, so it's actually just trying to, in, in lots of different bits of legislation, raise disability rights. And sometimes that can be in welfare reform, it can be education, it can be in... Um, you know trade bill there's lots of different ways that that you can sort of highlight the issues um and so really it's about trying to make it better for other people but the reality is is that you know every vote i ha- take and if i win or lose there'll be people who in some way we worse off that so you're, you're constantly trying to spin plates and juggle and figure out what what the best path through it is um so um you know for me i mean what i say about transport I just want disabled people to have the same miserable experience of commuting as everyone else. <laughs> because we're not I there yet. Yeah. It's, it's really miserable. At time, it can be great. But, but you know, I, I was talking to one train company and I'd had a few challenges with them and they said, can you tell us of any exceptional service you had? Well, I got on and off a train. Sorry. And, what to do? Yeah, Thanks. And, and, I said, no, and actually there was one which was very, very exceptional how it was treated. But just getting on and off the train is not exceptional. Yes. You know, that is what we expect. So some of our other the other people who we've spoken to, they speak about this light bulb moment. And um, was there this kind of this realisation of that's how I'm going to move forward? Was there a light bulb moment for you? Or, or some people have said it as actually to them, they call it more like fairy light. So for me, it was a string of, um, a string of lights that started off kind of with this... Uh, like dead bulb and then this glowing kind of like low light help hope of something better on that first Blesma ski trip then on to soldier ride Invictus games and the light bulbs getting brighter and brighter I get back and GB are interested in me doing sports I never thought that I'd be you know anything Um, so yeah it was that kind of brighter and brighter and brighter light bulb 
that occasionally gets dimmed, but then the next light bulb is, is coming. So for me, it's a string. You've given the best, most creative <laughs> description. Again. Yeah, <laughs> someone's like, yeah, it's a light bulb, you know, basic. But, um, can you relate to that, this idea of a, a light bulb or kind of that's a moment of clarity or...? Uh, it was my first wheelchair race I did. Um, you know, uh, I think I was 12 and school wow. sports day. And, you know, I played lots of different sport and I swam and I did horse riding um, and I really enjoyed all of it and basketball and tennis and... But my, my first wheelchair race I did, and I remember thinking, that's it. And, you know, I joke, but um, uh, it, it, every decision actually made from 12 was about me doing wheelchair racing. So down to, you know, I went to Loughborough University because mm -hmm. that was the place to do sport. And, you know, where I lived and who I trained with. And so it, it was all um, very much from that moment in time. And my parents encouraged me to play other sports until I was 16 because it's, it was good to play other sports to give me something else to do and to just help me realise that wheelchair racing was it but um, yeah um, from 16 I, I pretty much only did wheelchair racing um, but but it was that, that very first race I remember almost every single push of that first race I'm not sure I'd ever want to race you. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely would. These days. Um. <laughs> so a question I was going to ask, you've obviously made so much change happen and you still are doing that. For those listening who are looking to make change maybe in their own lives or in their own communities, what advice could you give them? You have to be passionate about something and care. And that's that's the first step. You know, you've got to be bothered. And there's loads of... My, my grandmother had an absolutely awful saying, but I can't think of another way to say it, but there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. Yes. It's awful. It's, but there's loads of different routes around and it's 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 looking at every single solution that's out there. Or um, And it might not be the route that you want to get there. Um, you know, I go into schools and I, you know, say to youngsters, you know, if there's something you care about... Because most young people say they don't care about politics... But actually they do. What they might not care about is the politics in this place. Um, and, you know, it can be letter writing. It can be having a protest. It can be, you know, writing to the newspaper. There's lots of things you can do. You need to get other people around you. But but you need to be able to stand back to, to, to kind of open yourself to those those new ideas. And then change can happen on lots of different levels if, if, you, if you want it to. Setting small goals as well, just ways to, to go forwards. And then you've got small goals along the way that they can achieve and once you've achieved one thing what else can you achieve what else can you do and I think for me that's really helped so take small little chunks and achieve one thing at a time and then suddenly you look back at the big picture and you've achieved a lot brilliant well thank you so much to you both um we're coming to the end of the podcast now and I just wanted to ask you both how have you found the conversation today and what are you going to take away from it do you know, I was so scared coming into this. So I'm always, always the same. Um, anything filmed and different people, I always kind of am not quite sure how I'm going to deal with them, uh, you know, deal with the situation. Um, but you've been really engaging, really relaxing. So thank you. Um, but I think for me, it's listening to Tanya about the things that we still need to go forwards and where, what I can do to progress disability rights and equality and maybe I, I, that I need to take more responsibility for those certain things and not just cuff over them so yeah no I, just, I found that really interesting and I think for me it's 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 about the people you have around you and um, you know I, I don't need to be the one that that does the change there's loads of ways to affect change and it's about building friendships and networks and whatever you want to call it and just finding other people who'll join you in the fight because actually when times are hard um, you know, I, I've worked on some really, really difficult legislation here, which, you know, has opened me up to sort of a level of personal abuse and just you feel like you're smashing your head into a brick wall. And one of the things that's made it better is is having one of my ex-training group ring me afterwards after a really difficult debate. And I remember him saying to me, you should have brushed your hair before you go in the chamber. <laughs> but seriously, after everything I was doing, that's what you do. And, and so for me, it's, it's having that network. And, and actually, it's always about meeting new people, finding that network. And, and finding the things you can work on together, which is always really positive. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much to you both. Baroness Tanny Gray-Thompson and Eris Pierce. thank you very much. Thank you, Alice.